An alleged Ponzi scheme falls apart, doesn't say they're out millions, because like so many before them, they trusted David Villanueva. That's when we found out that he was actually a convicted felon. One judge said he preyed on victims like a shark. Every time this man is allowed out, he just starts the cycle again and millions of dollars are missing. In this exclusive story, senior investigative reporter Jonathan Gatehouse breaks down one man's 30-year trail of deceit. David Villanueva may not exactly cut a rug on the dance floor, but fancy footwork is his specialty. Over the past three decades, he's claimed to be a boxer, lawyer, marriage counselor, and a wealthy businessman, going by a variety of names, including David Carter, Dr. David Anderson, and David Whitehead, a man with a talent for deception, who's left a national trail of unpaid debts, unhappy investors, and criminal convictions. It, it, was, it was crippling. Um, there's, there's no other way to put it. it, it the final number was well north of uh, $3 million. He actually promised me hope. I logged into my personal account and I see, oh, check bounce. It was a scam. It was a fraud. CBC News has spoken with dozens of people, including one former police officer who say they've been defrauded by Villanueva, with stories of failed business dealings dating back decades and financial losses totaling in the millions. Many wonder how he's still on the streets. Everything about him looks like he's successful. He has the nice suits, he's got the gold cards filled with his wallet, he's got the, the nicest vehicles. Neil McCormick was just starting his career in 2006 when Villanueva hired him to set up two Nova Scotia call centers. Six months later, Villanueva suddenly disappeared, leaving more than 40 employees and a string of creditors looking for money. We went to the RCMP to say, look, we need a fraud investigation opened up. And that's when we found out that he was actually a convicted felon who was under house arrest the entire time that this was going on. And there was another surprise for McCormick. Villanueva had set up a new company under his employee's name and transferred over all his call center debts, more than $3 million, he says. Trying to prove to companies that you don't owe this debt, um, it, was, it was devastating. It took a, a decade to, to recover from. If you search for Villanueva on the internet, almost nothing comes up, and all of his social media posts have recently been deleted. But CBC News has uncovered the 62-year-old's lengthy criminal past, six separate fraud convictions with jail sentences totaling 17 years. In Toronto, he was found guilty of running a fake law firm. In North Bay, he pretended to be a psychologist. There was a sham bid to buy a minor league baseball team in London, Ontario. And now, new allegations in Kitchener-Waterloo, where a man calling himself David Oje Villanueva recruited investors, promising to triple their money overnight in a complicated debt financing scheme. It, it would, nothing like the bank. You would not make this from the bank in years. And he goes, just watch me. Rose Takis met Villanueva through her job at a local jewelry store. After making a small initial investment that paid out handsomely, she was enticed to go all in remortgaging her house and maxing out a credit card to cobble together 85,000 more, money she hoped to use for renovations, almost all of it now seemingly gone. Green was not involved with this. This was for my family. This is, I wanted to help them in the future to be able to navigate this house and not go into a nursing home. Villanueva hasn't been charged with any crime in Kitchener although local police are looking into the allegations first brought to their attention last winter. Many of Villanueva's clients wonder why it's taking so long. CBC News contacted Villanueva to ask about the investor complaints, and he said he was eager to share his side of the story, agreeing to come to our Toronto studios for an interview. But he didn't show up. So uh, it's 2 o'clock, and that's when he said he'd be here, and no sign of him. Villanueva's past crimes are numerous, and authorities didn't mince words about his behavior. His fraud record dates back to 1995 in Sarnia, Ontario, where a judge described him as a liar, vulture, and parasite who preyed on victims like a shark. In parole records obtained by CBC News, one prison psychologist wrote that Villanueva lacked empathy and had a tendency to take advantage of others for his own ends, while another concluded 
he had the core personality traits of a psychopath. All this is, is real hard to manage. Doran Jinska was hired to do business development for Villanueva's latest venture in Kitchener-Waterloo. The workplace was chaotic, he says, with employees tasked to do jobs they weren't qualified for and a boss who was quick to anger. Things didn't add up. The business was, in my opinion, so, sort of falling apart from the very beginning. It wasn't anything that was supposed to be. Mostly, Jinska says he felt pressure to invest, even after he told Villanueva that both he and his wife are battling cancer. He said something that, I have something similar. I have to go on a daily basis to Toronto, to whatever hospital, but I didn't believe him. By late 2022, Villanueva was operating four different businesses out of this modest Waterloo office. Over the following months, many angry investors came here looking for their money, going so far as to disable the security cameras so that he wouldn't see them coming. Few, if any, were successful. And then at the beginning of April, Villanueva simply disappeared. That's when car dealer Adnan Khan started to worry about the Mercedes GLS he'd been renting to Villanueva. Payments were overdue, messages unanswered. So on April 3rd, he checked GPS tracking data on the car and saw that Villanueva appeared to be heading for the U.S. border. We called the cops and this is, they cannot do anything, has nothing to do with them. So we called the border services. In Sarnia? Yep. Villanueva eventually drove back to Kitchener, where Khan's employees were waiting to seize the car. It was packed with Villanueva's belongings, size 13 shoes, bags of clothing, and lots of checkbooks and financial documents. It's pretty good evidence. So you've, you've talked to the cops, right? Yep. And you've told them what happened. You told them that you have all of his possessions and his records. Yeah. And what did the police, have they come to get them? No. Nope. Nobody came here. Nobody did. And I, I explained it to them. We got a lot of stuff, a lot of evidence, as you can see. Some past victims, like McCormick, wonder how Villanueva is still free to hatch new schemes after decades of legal troubles. Every time this man is allowed out, he just starts the cycle again and millions of dollars are missing. There is a severe breakdown in our system. So, Jonathan, watching this, I just keep thinking, where's all the money these people invested? That is really the multi-million dollar question. We put that to David Villanueva in writing, along with a number of other queries about his past and what's happened in Kitchener-Waterloo. He declined to respond. He's now represented by a Toronto criminal defence lawyer, and so we put these questions to him as well. He too declined to respond or provide a comment, all of which leaves these investors waiting to see what, if anything, is going to happen from this Waterloo Regional Police investigation. So interesting. We know you're going to stay on it. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you. A family retraces the steps of their father's difficult journey to Canada. I think he would have done almost anything to come to Canada. And I think he probably did. Canada's painful history of targeting Chinese immigrants, next. A family's long-held secrets unravel. So, you know, you're curious as a kid, like, what's in here? The children of a Chinese immigrant trace their history. Do you remember yeah, this? Yeah. I remember this wow. like crazy. Along with old memories comes a bombshell revelation. Now, key to all of this were racist policies adopted by Canada, the Chinese head tax, and 100 years ago, the Chinese Exclusion Act. We follow one man who was among thousands affected by them. Florence Wong breaks down how and why. It didn't drive me crazy, but I thought about it a lot, and I just like, is there secrets in the, these letters, and, <laughs> and nobody can read them. It's been 15 years since these siblings have all been in the same room together, and we've just delivered some shocking information. Lily, Filler, Dorothy, and Riches grew up in Regina, the children of Chinese immigrants. Now they're in their 60s and 70s, and they've come back to learn how, despite the odds, 
their parents build a life here, something they were always tight-lipped about. I remember my mom saying, this drawer has all important papers. And it was just this drawer. So, you know, you're curious as a kid, like, what's in here? The siblings didn't know a lot about their dad's life before he moved to Regina. In 1913, George Hong Su Wong hopped on the Empress of Asia in Hong Kong and headed to Vancouver. He was just 17 years old. When George landed, he was slapped with a head tax. An estimated 81,000 Chinese immigrants had to pay this discriminatory fee to get into Canada. Starting at $50 in 1885, it cost $500 by the time George arrived. That's 15,000 in today's dollars. I know the way Dad felt about China, communist China. So I think he would have done almost anything to come to Canada. And I think he probably did. After welcoming laborers to build the Canadian Pacific Railway, the Canadian government decided it wanted to discourage further Chinese immigration. So it introduced the head tax, which wasn't repealed until July 1st, 1923. That same day, the Exclusion Act was introduced. It nearly entirely restricted Chinese immigration and prevented many Chinese people already here from obtaining Canadian citizenship to talk about the devastating impact of exclusion on Chinese communities and Chinese families is, is to think about the incredible isolation and loneliness uh, that these communities experienced as a result of exclusion. We couldn't find much about the first few decades George spent in Canada, but we know that by the late 1940s, he had settled in Gull Lake. It's a small community 300 kilometers west of Regina. George's son, Filler, remembers visiting the town with his dad to place a headstone at the cemetery. He'd always been curious who it was for. So we took him and his siblings to Gull Lake. Older than 63 is like okay. the 20s or 30s. Okay. We weren't able to find the grave, but we did track down the spot where George's cafe, United Nations, used to stand and met with someone who knew their father. Bernard Kerwin was a regular there. I was the only daily newspaper carrier, and took the, so I covered the whole town, and uh, it had about 60 or 70 customers, regular customers, and it was a daily, six days a week, and I had to drop one off at George's Cafe. A book about the town describes George as an avid hockey fan who drove the local teams to games. Bernard remembers his generosity. It was not uncommon for him to, uh, when the teams came back to town, he would open up his cafe after hours and, and have a meal. It'd usually be bacon and eggs and toast and coffee and that kind of thing. Very outgoing. <laughs> Quite a character, actually. This is the original one. I'm pretty sure that's the original. This is the business the Wong siblings remember. Back then, it was called Modern Grocery. It was one of the businesses George opened after moving to Regina in 1954. He ran it alongside his new wife, Nella Yu Oi. When the Exclusion Act was repealed in 1947, George was able to travel back to China to get married. The family of seven lived upstairs. It's still a Chinese-owned business, and the current owner was kind enough to show us around. Do you remember yeah. this? Yeah. I remember this. Wow. like crazy. This is insane. The, that's the original medicine cabinet. Yes, right? the original medicine cabinet. George and Nellie sent some of the money they earned overseas. It led to disagreements for the couple, though the kids never quite understood why. So he was sending money to his side, and then uh, my mom says, well, you need to send the same amount to her side. You know, even when he, my father passed, there were the, the, these lists of people, and I'm like, who are these people? Like, I had no idea. George passed away in 1984 at the age of 88. Two decades later, his wife, Nellie, was one of 785 Chinese Canadians who received $20,000 in compensation from the Harper government for the head tax. Today's apology will not erase the painful, the painful memories for which these past measures are responsible, but it will allow for the healing process to begin, allow us to unshackle ourselves from the burden of the past. Nellie continued to be haunted by her own past, something her children didn't fully understand until we translated those important papers she had stowed away in a drawer. They were addressing your mom's 
family. She had three children before she met your dad. She was widowed. And the interview questions were as if, as if they were instructing the two boys, which they wanted to immigrate to Canada, how to in answer interviews with somebody from, cust uh, from immigration. The fifth Wong sibling, Pearl, wasn't able to visit Regina, but she joined us by video conference, and it didn't take her long to connect the dots. She had cared for her mom in her later years. Suddenly, Nellie's erratic behavior makes more sense. That, those are the two boys she was talking about because when I had her in Calgary and she had to get hospitalized, she was looking for two boys and they didn't know. It's okay, Pra. It's okay, baby. <laughs> they were calling her from the other side oh. to go. We're unsure whether Nellie's sons ever made it to Saskatchewan. Among the documents are hospital services plan cards for the province from 1959 and 1960 that list the boys' names. That's the same time period they were corresponding with their mother and George. The plan was required for anybody who lived in the province for at least three months, but we couldn't find any other evidence of the boys in Canadian records. I knew that she suffered so much, but now this kind of even makes it worse about how much she suffered. Lily Cho says it's not uncommon for Chinese families in Canada to carry secrets like this. That's part of the legacy of the Exclusion Act. I think that if you live for decades as a community um, with very, very stringent laws leveraged against your existence, you will retreat into forms of silence and that will carry from generation, one generation to another. George and Nellie's sacrifices are not lost on their children. And it benefited all of us, in a way. We, we, we grew up in a free country, supposedly, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we can make our own destinies, right? I'm remembering those sacred moments with my father and having to come this far so that we can have what we have is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, is amazing, and I hope that all these other people who also came this, that same road find that happiness as well. And Florence tells us the Wong siblings plan to continue researching their family history. They're now turning to social media for more clues. A staff at an Ontario hospital were in for a big surprise this week. And finally baby came out and everyone was like, wow, look at that baby. The newborn who shocked doctors in our moment. That chubby and oh so beautiful baby is newborn Sunny Ayers, only two days old, already breaking records. So Sunny clocked in at over 14 pounds when he was born and doctors at that Cambridge hospital say that's the biggest baby they've ever seen since they started keeping track. So the record breaking infant is our moment. Wow, look at that baby. So this is baby Sonny. He was born on Monday, 14 pounds, eight ounces. So when this baby come, came out, of course it was a big head, a chunky head, and it was pulling and pulling, and finally baby came out and everyone was like, wow, look at that baby. Next thing you know, I had nurses coming in and they wanted to check him out. And Doctors taking a peek. They put it on the weighing scale, recalculating, recalculating, and finally, there was the weight, massive weight, and everyone was thinking, yeah, this is a big baby for sure. It does feel like a big weight has been lifted. Yeah, he's our, our fifth child, and hopefully we'll be able to bring him home tonight, and he'll uh, be smothered in smooches. I mean, this is a big baby, even by the standards of the hospital. I'm just happy that he's healthy. Sonny's our fifth, and we're done at five. <laughs> so, welcome to the world, Sonny, first. We've got a lot to tell you. There's a lot going on. Uh, the, do the doctors say they have been keeping track since 2010, and you're a record breaker already. From all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.